Please open your Bibles then, if you would, to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 11 this morning, we'll be looking into verses 24 through 28. And verses 24 through 28, Lord willing, we'll be looking into us. And I am calling this message, By Faith, Moses. Let's all stand as I read our verses for today. As we let the Lord know our hearts are ready for the implanting of the Word of God by the Holy Spirit. Father, we are humbled, Lord. And as we open up the Bible... I pray, Lord God, that you would open up our hearts and that our hearts and your word would merge together and be in unity and that, Father, we would walk with and be in agreement with everything you have said. Thank you for loving us, Lord. Thank you for giving us this time together. We cherish it and we cherish your word. We pray this in Jesus' precious name, everybody says. The writer of Hebrews chapter 11, beginning in verse 24, says, By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ, the Messiah, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith He kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch them. Please have a seat. I want for just a moment to bring us back to the context of this book, and more importantly than that, the context of this chapter. And to put it in the simplest form possible, this chapter is meant and given to us in order to encourage folks faltering in their faith. And it is here to lift them up by showing us other people in their situations, in their crises, where they could have gotten discouraged, but they didn't. And so as we look at this, we are looking at folks who could have gone one way, but by faith went an entirely different direction. That, that's important. I, I, I think that today, as we look at these verses, I want us to get an understanding I want us to grab a hold of the idea that what God called them to, God enabled them to do. So what God calls us to do, we are also able to do. God doesn't leave any of his kids hanging. What God calls you to, God will enable you to do. And we see that here, in particular, in the life of Moses. You see, the spiritual race, your spiritual race, can be run and won even in the face of crises and hard choices. By faith, there is a perseverance that is meant to be ours and is demonstrated by our faith. For me, that's flat out exciting. I look at that, I think of the concepts here in these verses and in this chapter, and it's exciting for me to look at it. These are not the untouchables of faith, not by a long shot. These aren't hall of faith people that are, you know, like, uh, you know, you walk into a, uh, a high school gym or a college gym, and you see a different, uh, you know, shirts that have been retired, 
right? Because that person was so great and they accomplished so many wonderful things that they hang their jersey up on the ceiling and they're just like untouchable. That's not at all the idea of Hebrews chapter 11. It's the hall of faith. Yes, it is. It's illustrations of faith. Yes, it is. But it is by people who are living, breathing, stumbling, getting back up in a fallen world. People who by faith and perseverance did what God called them to do. And the exciting part of it is we can do it too. You can do it too. The whole chapter is meant, I believe, to elicit in us a certain response. And the response that this chapter is after is something probably just, thank you, Father. I trust you. I can do it too. I can finish my race by simple faith and perseverance. You just keep moving forward in Jesus. That's God's plan. Don't make it complicated. It's not rocket science. Fix your eyes on Christ and make every step that you take, let it bring you closer and closer to him. And as we've talked about before, if you have to fall, by all means, fall forward. Amen? Now we are covering a span of about 80 years of the life of Moses. And the best on-screen performance of Moses goes to Charlton Heston. (laughs) You know, when I get to heaven and I actually see Moses, if he doesn't look like Chuck Heston, I'm going to be disappointed. (laughs) So last week we talked about baby Moses on Mother's Day. We talked about the faith of his mom and dad who rather than... They had a choice, didn't they? The choice was throw the baby in the Nile where he'll die or try and save the baby. And if you get caught, all three of you will die. So uh, uh, that wasn't much of a choice. But they, by faith, were able to move through a difficult situation. That's us. By faith able to move through difficult situations. Now, faith, of course, has been um, defined for us over and over in this chapter. And faith has something, of course, to do with an expectation that what God has said he'll do, he'll do. Faith is an absolute assurance in the promises of God. And so when I get a promise from God, I lock both arms around it and I embrace the promises of God. And we also found out that faith is always looking forward. So actually, anytime you see the word faith, or by faith, I suppose you could take the word faith out. So it says, by faith, Moses. Maybe you could say, by a full, complete assurance in the promises of God, looking forward to what was not yet there, Moses did thus and so. Just like you and me. Don't you find it interesting the folks that he has picked to show with acts of faith in chapter 11? You could go through the entirety of the Bible and you could pick one person after another. By faith, this one did that. By faith, this one did the other. You could be in Hebrews chapter 11. By faith. By this assurance that God promises eternal life to all who will believe in him. By that assurance, you forsook the world and gave your life to Christ. That's faith. Looking forward to the promises of God. Is heaven yours? By the way, is anybody here today still going to heaven? (laughs) Okay. That's by faith. And by faith, everything else. Every promise of God. That he'll never leave you or never forsake you. That his love is stronger than fear. That faith combats fear. That God has promised to provide for you. We don't have to freak out by faith. By this assurance, embrace of the promises of God. I came across a very, uh, I would say challenging uh, uh, quote by A.W. Tozer. And I know some of you are familiar with the books that he's written. 
This is what he said. God is looking for people through whom he can do the impossible. What a pity that we plan only the things that we can do by ourselves. Interesting, huh? Very convicting. It was convicting to me as I read it. I thought, what might God want to do through you? What might God want to do through me that would absolutely blow people's mind? And I went on to further think, is there anything I'm doing to hold back? Do you recall the story of Jesus going into a couple of towns and he said he didn't do very many miracles there. Does anybody remember that? He went into a couple of villages. He says, didn't do very many miracles there. And then it said, why? Because they didn't believe. They didn't have faith. So Jesus didn't do very many miracles there. I wonder what miracles might happen in our lives if we learn to grow in our faith, to stretch and to put ourselves out there. I wonder what God can do. Because you see, what faith relies upon is not our own ability. If you have some kind of an abstract thought about faith, I'm going to faith through this, then that's wrong. Faith is an absolute reliance upon God, not upon yourself. It's on his shoulders, not on your shoulders. He said that every word that he said will come to pass. He said heaven and earth would pass away before a single thing that Jesus said wouldn't be accomplished. I think I could trust that. What do you think? He's Jesus. He's batting a thousand, amen? (laughs) Three times in our verses, we read, by faith, Moses did this and did the other. So let's walk through them. Let's peer into them for our own encouragement. Here's the first choice that Moses had to make. Ooh, choices. It's about choices, isn't it? His first choice or his first perseverance or we could call it his first crises that came along. Even in the face of fear, the fear of the Pharaoh, he chose to identify with the people of God, embracing the promise of a coming Messiah. That's what faith does. Look at verse 24. By faith, Moses... (laughs) Isn't it? Even when you say his name, you want to, by faith, Moses. You know, it's just, by faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Imagine that. Pharaoh, you're not my grandfather. (laughs) And the daughter, she's not my mom. That's pretty bold, isn't it? That is the literal saying no to something. No. I disagree. That's wrong. I'm not going to go that way. Verse 25. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Moses was so positioned in Egypt that this guy had the keys to the city. All at his fingertips. Yet he looked at the passing pleasures of sin. You like that term? The passing pleasures of sin. Anybody know that sin's pleasurable? (laughs) We all know that, don't we? But here we're told that it's a passing pleasure. As a matter of fact, uh, in another place in the scriptures, it says sin is fun. How long? For a season. But eventually that season's over. And we find in our lives, if we're going to incorporate the wisdom from God's word that he gives us, that sin always takes us further than we wanted to go. It always keeps us longer than we wanted to stay. It always costs us more than we ever thought it would cost us. And it's harder to get away from than we ever thought it could be. That's sin. Sin is always a downward spiral. So Moses looks at it and he goes, those are passing pleasures of sin. I'd rather have Jesus than silver and gold, like the old hymn goes. Verse 26, esteeming the reproach of Christ, the reproach of the Messiah, the reproach of believing in the promises of God. I think some people are doing that today. They are esteeming 
the reproach of a belief in the coming of the Messiah. Anybody know Jesus is coming back? Some people are willing to esteem the reproach of the world and continue to believe in the return of Jesus Christ and they think of that as being greater riches than anything this world can offer. And Egypt, oftentimes in the scriptures, is a picture of the world. For he looked to the reward, just like us. Faith is always looking forward in what God has promised Notice where faith led him. And it most definitely was not the easy road. You know, as we look at the world today, I think what we're seeing more and more is that uh, uh, there is this growing persecution against uh, Christians. Have you noticed that? In fact, as you look around the world, it looks like, oh my gosh, we seem to be the last safe place. And we find even people from other countries, other Christians from other countries who can afford to, are moving here, North America, as the last safe place. Recently, a poll came out. The poll said that there are, for the first time ever in the United States, the number of Christians is going down rather than up. It was always going up, but just lately it has started to go down. Interesting that we too might end up facing the same persecution that we're seeing in other countries. Here are his choices in verse 25. He chooses, one translation has it, he chooses to share the oppression of God's people. And in verse 26, he thought it was better to suffer for the sake of Christ. Let me put it like this, because this is where your faith and mine will always lead us. This one little line. Eternity is better than now. Your faith will always take you there. Now these choices were made by Moses a long time before the Pharaoh ever got angry at him. There was something that had happened internally in Moses. There was something that was going on inside of him that was telling him, I know I'm in the palace, but I know this is not right. I know that everybody is doing their own thing, but I'm uncomfortable with it. There was something about living in the world once I've heard about God and the promises of God where I'm no longer comfortable here. Anybody experience that? Not quite comfortable here. Moses went through that. Moses had this thing going on inside, this kind of an inner turmoil as he began to grow up and find out that he was a Hebrew and hear about the Hebrews and hear about Yahweh and about what God did with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He began to say, who am I? Why am I here? What's this really all about? And he had this inner thing going on and he made these choices in his heart long before he ever broke away. Remember we talked about faith and we said that faith first happens in the heart before anything ever takes place with our feet? First, the heart, and then the feet, and then the feet. F-E-A-T-S. Moses, I believe, long before he did anything, He began to burn bridges in his heart. He burnt bridges to the things that are popular to the world that are contrary to what God says. He began to burn bridges in his heart. And as he began to burn these bridges in his heart, he looked at the Pharaoh and he said, this is not, you're not my king. He looked at Egypt and he goes, this is not my land just like you and just like me. Same with us. We don't wait around to be Christians, as it were, if you can use that expression. And I think what I mean by that is sitting back and saying, well, when something really great happens, when I really get some big prayers answered, then I'll really move out for God and I'll really commit. That's backward. What happens is you first have to burn the bridges. And the bridges are burnt in your heart. 
In fact, even as I was praying for us, I was like, Lord, even while I'm teaching, could you have some people begin to start these bonfires in their heart? What do you need to throw onto the bonfire of your heart that you've been holding back and it's this bridge to the world? I'm just kind of keeping this in reserve. Uh, like numbers in your cell phone that don't belong there or email addresses that shouldn't be there. Come on, let's get real, huh? Pictures you shouldn't have in your closet, whatever the case may be. There are things that have to be burnt first in our heart. You see, if my heart is filled with things of the world, then you tell me where's the room for God? Where's the room for God to do anything? You see, I think before my heart swells up with love, I got to burn a lot of junk that's in there to make room. I was talking to a brother, oh, this was, uh, well, not that long ago, about a year or so. And uh, he was telling me the particular struggle that he was having. He's not here in this church. <laughs> he was telling me about a struggle that he was having. And he was talking about, man, I am fighting that thing so hard and I am not winning. And every day I get up and I think I'm going to fight that thing and I, I just have all these plans and I'm going to go after it. And I can just see all the turmoil on his face. And I said, you know what I want you to try? I want you to try this. Don't fight it anymore. And he looked at me like I was absolutely nuts, like you're looking at me right now. But I don't want you to fight it anymore. I said, not that it's wrong to fight it. But what I want you to do is, I want you to so fill your days and your times and your thoughts with Jesus that you will no longer have room for that other thing. I want you to starve that thing out. Don't give it so much thought. Don't give it so much energy. Instead, move your affections onto Christ. He was so much looking at that sin and hating it and not wanting to do it that he just kept moving right towards it. That was about a year ago. This past week, he says to me, I want to thank you because that thing is getting so choked out in my life because I'm putting all my thoughts on Christ. So there's something that has to happen in our hearts and that's the burning bridges. That's the taking of our intentions and attentions off of that stuff and putting them onto something else and just let that thing starve out. That's how it works for us. It always brings us to that point where we say eternity is better than now. As a matter of fact, would you all say that with me right now? Eternity is better than now. Believers, we come from a long line of folks who risked everything to follow Jesus Christ. People who were content, I would say gladly content, to leave behind the passing pleasures of this world with an embracing of the world to come. And that these have done what these have done, we can do as well, even if it comes to facing death. God will give you the grace you need. He will give you the provision you need to say no to sin and to say yes to Him. He will give you the grace you need at the moment you need it. How, ma how many want God to give them all the grace they need right now? Okay, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> You get the grace you need when you need it. Because it's give us this day our daily bread. So, faith is the desiring of God that stands victorious over our desiring the pleasures of this world. And because of that, our desiring of God, faith then sets us free to live out amazing adventures, to love, to forgive, to share our faith, to live life on the wild side of pleasing God rather than the low living, commonplace 
life of living only to please self. Jesus says, you try to gain your life, what's going to happen? You try to be first, what's going to happen? <laughs> Look at verse 27. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. For he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Their faith goes again. The reward of faith is to see what's invisible. We're to see ourselves seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Man, I can hardly wait for heaven. I'm, I've never been there, but I am so homesick. I want to go and be with Christ far better than being here. And anything this world has to offer is not worthy to be compared. Not even the sufferings of this world that we so, you know, focus on are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us. What do I get when I go to heaven? Well, look, right now, here's what's going on. You're struggling every day. You're fighting every day. What are you fighting? You're fighting the course of this world. I was talking to, I had a conversation with somebody. I was at a grocery store or something. And I got in a conversation with somebody and, and uh, we started talking about, uh, he's my age, so he's old. And we were talking about uh, <laughs> the changes that we've seen in, the, in this last generation. Just this one generation. Things have changed, changed, changed so much. And uh, there was a couple, and, and we talked about it again on Saturday morning. That there was a couple of things that were like really important when, when we were young, and they were things like, I don't know, does anybody here remember civic duty? Civic duty. That was like really important, wasn't it, at one point? It was important. Civic duty. How about this one? Role model. That was like really important, wasn't it? We were told how important that is. Responsible citizenship. There was even on our report cards, I don't know, do they still do this? You got a grade for citizenship. Remember that? <laughs> those were really important concepts. Why are they gone? Why are those concepts gone? The reason is because you cannot have a society that is entirely self-centered, which means run to your bliss. Thank you, Oprah, for that one. <laughs> uh, do what pleases you. Go for it. Make yourself happy. You know, find out who you are. Eat, drink, pray, love. For tomorrow we die, something like that, you know. You cannot be self-centered and still hang on to the concepts of civic duty and civic responsibility and giving your life for other people. Do you understand that we're in a place right now where being a Christian looks way different than the rest of the world? That it really is the wild side of living. Do something today that's entirely juxtaposed to what this world would say and live for God. God, what would you have me do? What would you have me say? Where would you have me go? Who do you want me to call today? And do it by faith. By faith, make that phone call. By faith, talk to that person. By faith, give away something. Because every time you give, you're giving away your, your own selfishness. That's what I know about myself. Verse 27 again. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured seeing him who is invisible. Didn't Jesus say, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe? So today you're fighting the course of the world. You're fighting your own flesh. The flesh will do what the flesh will do. You cannot send it to charm school. You cannot put enough perfume on it so that it doesn't stink. The flesh is the flesh. It's like an automatic pilot. It always pulls towards sin. You're living in a fallen world, living in a fallen body that's falling apart. Don't you feel encouraged by that today? <laughs> you're fighting the course of the world. You're fighting your own flesh and you're fighting the devil. How many know that the devil is, he's like he's on holiday right now, huh? 
He's, he's running around right now, and, and all his little henchmen, and they're going, happy days are here again. We can just get to run amok. They just get, and any door that a society opens up for evil only does one thing. It opens the door for more evil. And when you open the door for more evil, it only opens the door for more evil. So things that only a handful of years ago were like, we wouldn't have thought anything else. I'm thinking, I'm not thinking of a long time ago. I'm thinking of Bill and Hillary. All the FOBs, all the friends of Bill. I remember Bill getting up there and he was saying, I believe in the sanctity of marriage and that it is between a man and a woman only. Do you remember Queen Hillary? I mean, uh, do you remember Hillary saying that as well? She did the same thing. I believe in the sanctity of marriage and that it is only between a man and a woman. What happened in just a handful of years? Where are we now? You know, I think of the things that, that, that I faced when I was a kid. The love, I was raised in the love generation and all those hippies were around and everything like that. Uh, <clears throat> bell, bell bottom pants, beetle boots, the, the whole nine yards, you know? We were rebels. <laughs> and I think of the trouble that we could have gotten into back then. It's nothing compared to the trouble that kids can get into today. It's not even close. You know where we're at right now? We're, we're, the next thing that you're going to see is, uh, is uh, not only are you going to... You give a kid an iPad and marijuana and you'll never see him again. That, that, that's, the end of, that's the end of your... And we're, aren't we right there? We're like, we're like right there. What happened? What happened that I, just uh, four days ago, uh, Denzel Washington did a, gave a speech at a college. Anybody see that? All right, so they told Denzel, do not talk about God and do not mention the name of Jesus. Guess what he did? He talked about God and he mentioned the name of Jesus and he says, it was my mom's prayer for me that meant success in my life. And then he talked about faith. And then he says, I'm going to tell you all one thing. Put God first in your life. Boy, I tell you, my heart just soared, you know, and I heard that, you know. Praise God. What is, why, why should we be ashamed of the God who redeemed you, the God who's forgiven you, the God who's given you eternal life, the God who's coming back for you? Oh my gosh, I want to live for Jesus. And I am willing to forsake the passing pleasures of this world. To look at this world and it no longer awes us. We are unawed by this world. I like what uh, the Amplified Bible did to verse 27. Listen to this the, from the Amplified Bible. Motivated by faith, Moses left Egypt behind him, being unawed and undismayed by the wrath of the king. For he never flinched but held staunchly to his purpose and endured steadfastly as one who gazed on him who is invisible. Is that great? No, no, no. This is us. Calvary Chapel. This is us. By faith, we leave the world behind. This is not our home. We come to the place where the world no longer awes us. Instead, we, not flinching, hold fast to what God has for us in every day. His purpose and His plan and His will above all else. We look by faith with eyes of faith on Him who is invisible. That's us. And in Moses' case, he knew a little something about persevering in faith, didn't he? Once leaving Egypt, it was another 40 years before he ever came back. Okay, you know about the ripple effect of perseverance in your life, endurance? Do you, are you aware of that? There is a spiritual, I'm going to call it a spiritual law. There is a spiritual consequence. There's a spiritual 
cause and effect to perseverance. This is huge. This will determine whether you, whether you become a nominal Christian or a phenomenal Christian. Whether you are weak in faith or whether you have strong faith. It is the ripple effect of perseverance. It's in Romans chapter 5, verses 3 through 5. And it says the following. We also glory in tribulation. Those are trials. Knowing that tribulation produces perseverance. Endurance. And perseverance, character. And character produces hope. Do we have any here today? Any enrollees in PTP? That's perseverance testing phase. Anybody in that place right now? All right, we got a couple of them. And don't laugh too hard because you're next. <laughs> you know, don't you see how much we need each other? We need each other because we need to pray for each other because the same struggles you're going through are the same struggles that I go through. Because we're to operate by faith. Because without faith, it's what? Impossible to please God. It's not like it's not, you know, you can't say it's, well, without faith, it's, it's, it's probably you won't ever please God. It's not likely to happen. It, it probably won't. No, no, no. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. As a matter of fact, anything that's not of faith is sin. We go through the same struggle all the time. What's the struggle? This pull of the world versus my faith in what God has said and what God has promised, my embracing of that, my seeing it before it gets here. So it's important that we encourage each other. It's important that we hold each other accountable, isn't it? It's important that the church leaders hold us accountable. Is that an amen or not? Amen. Let me give you an example. Do you, do you remember how Moses got out of town, out of Egypt? Uh, don't read it now, but later on uh, uh, you can read Exodus chapter 2. But Moses is having this eternal conflict, and it's growing inside of him. He looks at the world and he says, you know, I... I this chariot, is, it's not me anymore. It's, I would rather be with, with the people of God. This palace that I'm... And look at how there's... I would rather be suffering with them. And this etern, internal conflict is going on in Moses. And then he sees a, a, a guard. Uh, and this guard is beating uh, one of uh, the children of God who's you know, they made bricks out of, they helped build the pyramids and made bricks out of straw and you can still find the bricks there. And you find some bricks have a lot less straw than others and they beat them and they, then when they protested, they took more straw away and build more bricks with less straw. And, and so Moses sees this and he just, he just flips out. And it says he looked this way and he looked that way and he didn't see anybody and he went over and he killed the guard who was beating the guy. And then he, 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 he stuffed the guy in the mud pit, you know. He may have looked this way and that way, but he didn't look up. Here's what I'm saying. Here's what I'm saying with praying for each other and holding each other accountable and leaders holding each other accountable. If Moses had a pastor and Moses went and spoke with his pastor... And Moses said to his pastor, Pastor, I want to forsake this world and I want to live for the coming Messiah. The pastor would go, awesome, bro. You go for it. And Moses says, not only that, but I would rather pass on the passing pleasures of sin and I would rather live for God than live in, in all this luxury. The pastor goes, right on heart, brother. And then Moses goes, the way I want to do it is I want to kill a guard then the pastor would have to say, uh, I love your heart, but what you want to do is wrong. <laughs> Amen? 
And we do that in the same kind of a way. That's what leaders of the church do. That's what we do when we hold each other accountable. That's what we say, you know what? I, I know your heart. I know what you want to do. I know what, what, what you want to do for God. But you know what? You need to do it a certain way and in a certain order. God is a God of order. And so Moses had to go out to the backside of a desert and he had to wander around in the desert taking care of sheep that were not his own, belonged to his father-in-law. He had to do that for 40 years till he was muttering on the backside of the desert. And then he was ready to be used. He had to be totally and completely humiliated and humbled to the point where he told God, I stutter. You can't even use me. The prince of Egypt... See, Moses thought he was somebody and had to find out that he was a nobody in order for God to use him for his glory. It's the same with us, isn't it? I'm nobody, God. I don't want any glory out of this. And I want to do things based on your word and in your order and in your timing. Look at verse 28. By faith he kept the Passover, and we'll end with this. And he... He kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch them. I wish I could have heard this conversation with God and Moses. Moses, yes, Lord. I'm sending the death angel. Imagine that. I mean, we know the whole story, so we're very relaxed about it. But if God tapped on your shoulder and said, I'm sending the death over, the death angel, I'm sending him over your house and everybody that you love. Wouldn't that put you in a bit of a panic? (laughs) The death angel, Moses, is going to do a flyby over your homes and he's coming tonight. And the firstborn of everybody that the angel flies over, they're all going to be dead. That's not only the firstborn people, but all the firstborn animals. They're going to die. If it's a firstborn Moses, the death angel is going to kill them all. That's about as serious as you can get, huh? Some people say it's as serious as a heart attack. We should say it's as serious as a flyover by the death angel. That's how serious it is. But Moses... If you will sprinkle the doorposts with the blood of a sacrificed lamb, when the death angel sees it, he will pass over and not touch you. He won't stop in at your house. Only the homes not covered by the blood, their death will enter. It's the same today. Moses believed God and showed his faith when he led all of God's people in the Passover feast and the sprinkling of the blood in obedience to God. Today, who will God judge in the end? Those not covered by the blood of Calvary. There's no other way. The blood speaks of the death of Jesus, the perfect spotless Lamb of God sacrificed for our sins. By faith in Jesus Christ, eternal death passes us by and eternal life belongs to us. It is our faith and not our works that make us right with God. Our faith allows God to forgive us of all our sins and to go even farther than that and to say to you and to say to me, Paul, all of you who have the blood on, I I won't even remember your sins. It's Look, it's not like God takes your record and erases everything on it. I mean, that'd be great enough. But with Christ, you don't even have a record. There's no record. There's nothing there on account of Christ and your faith in Him. The record doesn't even exist. The Bible says that the enemy accuses the brethren every day. He's like, God, look at him, look at her, look what they're doing, look what they're doing. And then you in your little home in the middle of the night, you say, oh Father, forgive me of my sins. 
Wash away my sin. Make me new. The enemy said, he did this and she did. Just look at their record. And God says to the angel, okay, go pull his record. Off goes the angel. A few minutes later, the angel comes back and God says, did you pull his record? And the angel says, there's no record. Is that awesome? God, there's no record? There's no record when you put faith in Christ. Let me end with this. 1 John 5, 11 through 13. And this is the testimony. You ready? This is the testimony. That God has given us eternal life. And this life is in His Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for these verses, Lord. I thank you so much, Lord God, that you have both exhorted us today in your word. You have encouraged us today in your word. You have lifted us up, Lord God, with the understanding that if they can do it, so can we. And I pray now, Father, that you would confirm your word to the hearts of your people even now. And you could just in this moment listen to the Lord and listen to him say, you're mine. You're mine. You're mine. Oh, you struggle. Oh, you fight against me, but you're mine. And I will never leave you. And I will never forsake you. Thank you, Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Everybody says, amen. amen. Let's all stand up.